finding this passionate for I've got a lot to live up to now. So hopefully this, this works out. Um, so the title of my talk is perhaps a little bit ambiguous, right? It's just gravity in the unseen sky. Um, but I'm going to give you a roadmap to give you a feel for what I'll talk about today. So I'm just going to give the briefest of brief touches on current gravitational wave detectors. I think my understanding based on the word Jaguar that everyone here is somehow affiliated with or knows something about gravitational wave science. So I'm not going to give an introduction on gravitational waves at all, but I'm happy to take questions about them. I'm going to talk about some work I've done in, in efforts to detect the stochastic background of gravitational waves using the pulsar timing array, which is one of these detectors. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some work we've done to try to test general relativity um, with hopeful future observations using pulsar time arrays. So let's just jump in. Um, like I said, I'm not going to give a lot of background here, but this is just a basic plot showing us the gravitational wave frequency spectrum and something called characteristic strain, which tells us something about the strength of the gravitational waves we're expecting to measure. And we can see here that we've basically got three groups of things. So at the very low frequency end of the gravitational wave spectrum, we've got this big orange box here, um, which corresponds to pulsar time array experiments. So these are trying to aim um, to detect things like supermassive black hole binaries. Sort of this intermediate frequency regime here, we've got a different set of, of astrophysical sources and an experiment called LISA, which I don't really talk much about today. And then at the higher frequency end, we have LIGO and laser interferometers. So there are first two major um, experiments here that are both imminently expecting to detect gravitational waves and occur within the next five years, I think, from both of these collaborations. I'm actually a member um, both of LIGO and of Nanograd, which is a pulsar timing collaboration. So I often joke with people that it's fun to be a member of both collaborations so that I don't have to worry about who makes the first detection and who is the way to go. Uh, but we should be looking at an imminent detection either way. And just to reiterate on the sources we're looking at here, um, again, for pulsar timing arrays, we're talking about primarily supermassive black hole binaries. In this intermediate regime, we have um, binaries that have less massive objects, and then for LIGO and ground based interferometers, things like compact binary coalescence and supernova. So those are the primary detectors, and I think it's important, always important in these talks, to reflect on how our experiments are complementary to one another. You know, there's a lot of this joking about uh, competition, but we're really trying to do complementary science, and when we make detections, we're going to do things that are just going to further our field in a, in a wonderfully positive way. So I'm going to focus today on pulsar timing arrays. Uh, right now, there are three major pulsar timing arrays in the globe. We've got the European, European pulsar timing array in Europe, the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array in Australia, and the North American Nanoverse Observatory for Gravitational Waves here in North America. And together, these conglomerate to form something called the International Pulsar Timing Array. And um, Chiara made this lovely slide that talks about how we're doing science with pulsar timing arrays. So the idea here, you start at the top of this figure, and we've got our sources for our gravitational waves. So these are the binaries that we're looking at. And these binaries move over and they perturb um, space-time, so pulsars, which are emitting these radio signals, are being affected by these black holes that are merging. There are all kinds of things happening in the interstellar medium between the pulsar and the Earth where we're making measurements, and we can use software and all kinds of, of fancy, sophisticated techniques to do a lot of science just in this top part of the picture. So without even talking about gravitational waves, when you're just talking about the context of pulsar timing, we're looking at these pulsars and timing them, there's this fantastic wealth of science going on. Um, but then when you add gravitational wave science into it, we have different types of gravitational waves we're looking for. We've got a stochastic background, something I'll talk about more in a minute, um, something called continuous waves. You can have bursts of gravitational waves. All these together contribute to another whole big body of science. So you can see that there's a lot of science going on. And it's not all just gravitational waves, but of course, that's the part we're most interested in today. So I know not everyone here works on pulsar timing arrays. I think we have some people who I just met in the LIGO meeting a few minutes ago. So I want to give a little introduction, very briefly, about how a pulsar timing array tries to detect gravitational waves, or how you can use one. And the idea here is that you take a millisecond pulsar, which is probably the most stable kind of clock that we have in the universe. So this diagram over here is called a PP dot diagram. And you have the log of the period derivative on this axis and period here. And this diagram is effectively showing you the lifespan of a pulsar. So the idea is that pulsars are born in supernova explosions, and they tend to be born sort of in this uh, upper right-hand part of this plot here. And over their lifespan, they tend to evolve over these, these dashed lines here are lines of constant magnetic field. So over a pulsar's life, it evolves down these constant lines of magnetic field while emitting radio waves. 
until they get kind of into this graveyard zone. They're emitting radio waves, so they're losing energy, and that's why they go down into this graveyard zone. And you can see that there's this huge pump up here, but then there's this secondary pump down here. And these, these pump of, of points all have little circles around them. And that's because these points are pulsars that are located in binary systems. So they're kind of a bizarre class of pulsars. They're set very far apart from these isolated pulsars. And the funny thing about these ones is that they have the smallest periods. So these are our millisecond pulsars. We think that they get spinning so fast because there's, uh, they undergo a process called recycling where they end up in a binary system and basically a creep napper off of a companion and use that, that accretion to spin themselves up faster. But we're using them in pulsar timing because they are so stable. Now what happens is that we're sitting on the Earth all the time doing kind of the Jodie Foster thing in our radio telescope, and so we have this pulse train with signals from the pulsar that are being emitted, and they're emitted just like this atomic clock signal for millisecond pulsars. But if we have a gravitational wave that's passing just somewhere in the space between the Earth and the pulsar, like this purple line here, what happens is that that, gravi that gravitational wave induces a redshift into the pulsar signal. And you can actually go and look at your old GR textbook and take out the geodesic equation and figure out exactly what that redshift is. But what we're actually physically observing in pulsar timing experiments is not the redshift, it's actually something called the timing residual, which is the difference between a pulse's actual time of arrival of the Earth and the timing you expected it to arrive of the Earth. And that timing residual is actually related uh, physically to the redshift by just a simple interval. So important to note that the redshift is the actual effect of the gravitational wave on the signal, but the, the thing that we actually physically observe is this timing residual. Okay, so I want to talk about the next part of the next part of my talk. Um, this is work I've done with a number of people, some of whom are actually in the room, um, to try to detect stochastic backgrounds of gravitational waves with pulsar timing waves. And it's an interesting story. So the idea here is that if you have an array of pulsars and they're all being hit by a gravitational wave, their, their signals are all being redshifted, then you should expect to see a correlated deviation in their times of arrival of the Earth. And this was first shown by someone called Hellings and Downs in 1983. So we have this curve called the Hellings and Downs curve here. Um, and they basically showed that you should expect to see that curve if a gravitational wave is passing between the Earth and some pulsars. You should be able to look at all of your pulsars and see that same correlation in all of them. So what some people have proposed to do as a search for gravitational waves is to basically take your data and try to fit this curve to this data. And that's what this plot is from. This is actually a plot from this paper by Chanel in 2005 where they said, okay, I have some data. Let me try to fit this curve to it. If the curve fits, maybe I have a gravitational wave there. But it's not really the most robust way to do this, perhaps. One thing that we could do that might be better is to try to find an optimized cross-correlation that takes into account our gravitational wave spectrum and noise power spectrum. And I'm going to try to sort of color code everything to make it a little bit easier here. But this is what, what we're talking about. So we have some correlated residuals, a source spectrum, and then this thing I'm calling the Helling's down coefficient, which basically just represents this curve. So in my talk, I'm going to be talking about this. This is all work we've done to try to detect a stochastic background, which is one sort of type of gravitational wave. And just as a refresher, if you're not familiar with a stochastic background, it's a background that's generated by a large number of independent individually unresolvable sources across the sky. So it's kind of analogous to the CMB. It's like a, a path of gravitational radiation. And, and the sources, again, are things we talked about earlier, things like supermassive black hole binaries. You could have cosmological sources. Um, but basically, looking at those sources, we're able to determine this source spectrum, this equation that we're looking at here. So we just have some um, function that tells us the source spectrum. We know what the Helmets and Downs coefficient is because we talked about this in the last slide. So this is the expected correlation that we'd like to see. So if we want to solve this problem of how to look for a gravitational wave, we've got to figure out how to get these timing residuals. Now I want to take a moment before I go further to say people have, have done this and, and it's been something people have worked on for a while. So actually in 2009 there was a paper by Ampham et al. Um, where they tried to design this optimal cross-correlation that takes into account the gravitational wave source spectrum and the Helmets and Downs coefficient. But they did everything in the frequency domain. And it turns out that pulsar timing data is actually very irregularly sampled. So this is actually a, a picture out of a paper by Hobsonel, which I forgot the site there. But um, each of these little lines, which may be hard to read if you're sitting in the back, these are all pulsars. And these little dots are just literally time stamps for data that was collected. And you can see that there's a huge amount of irregularity in that, in that way that we're sampling our data. 
And furthermore, we have to know something about the timing of the pulsar. We have to build what's called a timing model. We have to know when we expect the, the pulse to arrive at the Earth. And so all of this lends itself to the idea that perhaps we should work in time domain. So everything that's going to follow from here is worked on the time domain. Third question? Uh, how long does the data last? Oh, I think this is about a 15 year time scale, I believe. Okay, so let's talk about how we get those time intervals. It, it starts with the radio telescope. We measure pulse times of arrival. And basically these TOAs, or time of arrivals, they're basically the phase of the pulsar that you're measuring. And so you can actually try to approximate the phase of the pulsar by doing Taylor expansion if you really wanted to. And it works okay, but then we have to account for all these other things we know about. So, for instance, uh, we've got all kinds of things going on in the interstellar medium. There's electrons that are scattering light and dust. Um, there's pulsar spin down. The pulsars are losing energy from radiating electromagnetic radiation. There are things called pulse phase jitter, all kinds of things that we know about. And we have to account for them because we're looking for a gravitational wave. We don't want to know other things that can delay our signal. We want to find a gravitational wave. So we try to approximate our, our time of arrival to create a model of when we expect our, our pulse to arrive at the Earth. And then we have to figure out something about what's going on with the noise. So we like to assume that, assume that the noise is a Gaussian process and it consists of some intrinsic red and white noise components and hopefully for lucky a gravitational wave signal is there. So then what we do is we project this timing model out of our data using just a, a linear operator. And this is all really good, but all the information about the noise and sources and stochastic background is contained in this end which is the thing that we project out. So what we really need to do is to work with our observable, which is a timing individual. So I'm going to do, get a little bit nasty for a minute here, um, but bear with me. We're just going to assume you have a pulsar timing array that has a bunch of pulsars. So maybe you have m pulsars that you're timing. And we assume that the intrinsic pulsar noise is Gaussian, so you can go ahead and write down a likelihood function for that pulsar timing array, and that's just a standard multivariate Gaussian, which looks like this. You've got this um, noise time series, and you've got some pre-fit noise covariance matrix, and then you've got some parameters that characterize the noise. And that's all good and fine, but the problem with this is that we don't measure n. We measure the timing residual. That's our observable. So we have to do some math and recast our likelihood in terms of, of the timing residual. So we do that. We end up getting something that looks almost identical. Now we have a likelihood that has our observable quantity, r, and we've got these covariance matrices here where these diagonal terms depend on the red noise power spectrum. So basically this is, the pulsar hat might have some, some of its own intrinsic red noise, but then hopefully there's a gravitational wave signal in there as well. And then we've got these off-diagonal terms. And these off-diagonal terms, they go back to the tellings and bounce curve. So these depend on that curve, as well as the, the gravitational wave power spectrum. Now, in gravitational wave science, we're often in this weak signal limit where we have vastly more noise than signal in the data that we're looking at. And so in that limit, you can get an optimal detection statistic or an optimal cross-correlation by maximizing the likelihood over gravitational wave amplitudes. And so we do that, and we get this, this lovely um, expression here, and we choose this normalization factor so that we also get a maximum likelihood estimator for the amplitude of the background. And the point here is that you want to quantify the significance of the expected correlations between the pulsars, but you want to give a larger weight to timing residuals that have lower noise levels. And you can also write down an SNR for the statistic. And the, the takeaway from this is that the SNR represents the strength of the correlated signal compared to an uncorrelated signal of the same strength. So I know this is a lot of sort of statistics and math elements, but the idea is we have this optimal detection statistic, and we actually spend this is sort of the derivation of those last slides was work that a group of us did probably about two years ago. So we actually took all that and we decided let's make ourselves a gravitational wave pipeline and try to look for gravitational waves. So we wrote ourselves some code, we some Python, and you crunch some numbers and we see what happens. And in doing so, we've discovered that there are some limitations of this method. So the idea, the reason that we started working in the time domain was that we needed to find a way to deal with these irregularities in our sampling. We had to figure out how to deal with problem noise. And this is a very lovely method to do that, um, but it has drawbacks, and it has to do with how we model the noise, which is much more detailed than I want to talk about today. But you basically model the noise at each pulsar individually. What ends up happening is that you can have potential biases in the amplitudes you recover. So it's got some drawbacks. Um, the idea is that it's not a substitute for a full Bayesian analysis. That's really what we've come to realize as we 
we process this. But if you really want to do the best you can do, you're really just going to have to go after the full Bayesian analysis um, to try to find a gravity toy. But it has some advantages, this optimal statistic or this optimal cross-correlation. And that, first of all, it's very computationally expensive. So I know anyone in here who works on, on Bayesian inference will know that there are computational challenges in doing that. Um, this is very quick, on the other hand. And also the way we define SNR on the last slide, it ends up being a great approximation to the Bayes factor when you're doing that analysis. Um, another couple of things you can do, there's some, some sort of bonus applications of this optimal statistic. One is that you can develop something called scaling laws for pulsar timing rays, which basically answer the question, you know, if I want to, if I want to detect a gravitational wave soon, am I better off to go to my telescope and take data more often? Am I better off spending my energy looking for more, more pulsars? So we have these scaling law efforts that try to, to answer those questions to tell us how we should spend our time. And this is a statistic we can use to really quantify those questions. Um, and finally, you can actually use this optimal statistic to create novel um, injections of signals. So I don't want to talk any more about the details of this paper, um, but we just published it. Actually, I just sent the proofs, I think, two days ago. So it's been submitted to Physical Review Fee, and that should be showing up very soon. But I encourage people to go on the archive and take a look at that paper because there are a lot of very interesting details there. So next, I'm going to talk, kind of change the boards a little bit, and we're going to talk about testing general relativity with the SAR timing rays. So this is work based on a paper I wrote with Bobby Siemens at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And again, we're looking at stochastic backgrounds of gravitational waves. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. The idea behind this work is that we really need, when we make a detection of gravitational waves, we need to use that to test general relativity. We have tested general relativity in weak field regimes, so we've done solar system tests of general relativity. We've um, observed the precession of the parity on Mercury. We've seen light bending on massive objects, um, but we haven't been able to test gravity in a strong field regime. So when we finally detect a gravitational wave, it's going to give us a chance to do that for the first time. And the other point is that there are a number of viable theories that exist that can compete with relativity. So by viable, we mean theories that satisfy the Einstein equivalence principle. These are theories that are also going to satisfy weak field tests of relativity. And the, the theories that we're calling viable that satisfy the equivalence principle, we traditionally call the metric theories of gravity. <laughs> so the idea with the metric theory of gravity is that you could have another gravitational field besides the metric although only the metric itself can interact with matter. So these sort of extraneous fields that you end up having play the role of generating space-time curvature. And the way that we like to try to distinguish these metric theories from one another is by the number and types of other fields involved. So in some of these theories, you're adding an extra scalar field in addition to the metric. In some cases, you're adding an extra vector field. Sometimes um, there are theories where you have sort of what's called prior geometry that you're characterizing. So these are all are things that are very interesting. And there are, I tried to make a list of all of the metric theories that, are, that people are working on right now to put on the slide, and it, it wouldn't fit. So there are a lot of these theories out there that people are actively working on. Now, when I talk all about gravitational waves, so we need to understand what happens with gravitational waves when you generalize from general relativity to any old metric theory of gravity. And what ends up happening is that now, instead of having two possible gravitational wave polarizations, what you have for PR, you can actually have as many as six gravitational wave polarizations. So this, this figure here, um, these little rings here, are showing you the effect of a gravitational wave passing through a ring of matter. So for example, um, the plus and cross modes right here, these are the two gravitational wave polarization modes allowed in general relativity. And what this figure is showing you is that the gravitational wave is propagating out of the board towards you, you get sort of that traditional stretching and squeezing motion. Now here I've got this breathing mode. So here, if I have a gravitational wave coming out of the board towards you, my ring of test masses is literally looks like it's kind of breathing. And the reason I've only put six of these modes, in, or three of these modes and not six, is because I want to point out that these three polarizations are transverse. These correspond to a transverse wave, right? You have a gravitational wave coming out of the board towards you. All of the motion that your test masses undergo is perpendicular to the direction your gravitational wave is traveling. Now, here are the other possible three polarizations, and you can see that these are not transverse in the sense that if the gravitational wave is moving to the right, as this arrow indicates, the motion of your test particles is in that direction. And so what we have is these two vector modes, so the so-called vector x and vector y mode. And then right here is what we call the longitudinal mode. The longitudinal mode is really sort of the most fully non-transverse gravitational wave you could have. Virtually all of the 
the effect on the matter is in the same direction that the gravitational wave is, is propagating. So it's very interesting. We've got three transverse polarizations, three non-transverse. Um, we typically tend to denote these, these top two are tensor polarizations, these middle two we call scalar polarizations, and then the bottom two we usually call vector polarizations. So earlier in this talk, I was outlining this optimal statistic technique that we, we try to use to detect gravitational waves. And the question I might ask you is, well, what happens if we try to repeat that analysis when we have the possibility of these other polarizations? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with a picture. This is what I always think my students do when they're solving problems is to draw a picture. So that's how we'll start. I want everyone to imagine we have a single pulsar and the Earth, and we have a gravitational wave that's propagating nearby. I just want to give everyone a feeling for the notation I'll be using. So here, this p hat vector is a vector that points from the Earth to my pulsar. And then this omega hat vector is the direction my gravitational wave is propagating. So we know that, by definition, redshift, in terms of frequency, is basically your emitted frequency minus your observed frequency over your observed frequency. We know that the gravitational wave is inducing a redshift from the pulsar signal. So if we do a little bit of GR, Detweiler was the first person to do this, you can write down the redshift that the pulse should experience in the time domain. And I want to talk a little bit about these terms. So this first term here, we've got some p hat and some omega hat, and these p, p's here. So this is basically a geometrical term. This blue term is something that describes the pulsar Earth gravitational wave geometry. And then in these brackets here, this green term is called the Earth term. This is a term that's kind of special. We have a whole array of pulsars, and they're all simultaneously emitting pulses that are traveling to the Earth. The only thing that's going to be correlated among them is a gravitational wave signal. And so the Earth term is something that encapsulates that statement, basically. And then we have this pulsar term in red. This is a term that's not correlated for all pulsars. And it depends on the distance between the Earth and the pulsar. So it's kind of funny because the last, the last half of this talk I was talking about going from frequency domain to time domain. But now I'm going to, I'm going to tell us all it's easier to work with the frequency domain for what happens next. So I'm actually going to take this expression for the redshift and move it into the frequency domain by doing a Fourier transform. And when we do that, we get this expression, which is pretty similar. You still have a pulsar term, which is just this thing now. You still have an Earth term, which is just a one. And we still have this geometric term here. And now we've got this so-called polarization tensor. So these A's just depend on what polarization mode you're looking at. We have six possible modes. We've got the plus and cross of GRM, and we have these four extras. And then we have this HA, which is like an amplitude of your gravitational wave. So what happens, if you, if you look at this expression, it turns out that things can get a little bit sticky in the case when the gravitational wave direction of propagation and the position of the pulsar are anti-parallel. Because what that means, geometrically, if these two things are anti-parallel, when I take the dot product here, I'm going to get a minus 1. So I get 1 minus 1 in the denominator. And it kind of looks like this redshift blows up, which I never like it when things blow up. It's always a bit of a mess, right? So we have to figure out what happens. And since it looks like this term is blowing up, that suggests to us that we might want to do a Taylor series expansion on this term. So the idea is that there are two possible physical scenarios that would allow us to do a Taylor expansion. The first one is when you're in something called the long wave length limit. Mathematically, that's the case where this term f times L is small. So if you want to do a series expansion on this thing, you want this thing to be small. And if f times L is small, what that means physically is that the metric perturbation is the same at the pulsar and at the Earth. It's literally like the wavelength is so long that the metric perturbation is just the same at both of them. The second case where you could do a series expansion on that pulsar term is when this term in parentheses is small. When 1 plus omega dot e is really small compared to this 1 over f times L. f is just the frequency of the gravitational wave, and L is the distance to the pulsar. Um, in the literature, this second case is typically referred to as something called surfing. And the idea, again, is that the metric perturbation at the pulsar, when the pulse is emitted, and on the curve from the pulse is received, are also almost the same. But physically, it's a different scenario from the long wave. Now, in this surfing regime, it's really tempting to go back to what we've written for redshift in the, in the time domain and just say, well, if the metric perturbation at the pulsar and at the earth are about the same, then I'm just going to subtract these two things and they're going to cancel and the redshift is just going to vanish. Um, so it's tempting to do that, but it turns out that that's not right because in 
frequency when there's this really delicate interaction that happens that ends up canceling turns in a very special way. So what we're going to do is stay in the frequency domain and do a, do a series expansion, more series expansion fun. So we're going to take this omega dot p term and let it be minus 1 plus delta, where delta is something very small. It's a small parameter. And we're going to do a regular old series expansion on our redshift. So when you do that, the redshift goes from this expression to this one here. And so you can see in this expression, we have a redshift that's proportional to this product, f times l. And then we've got some geometric terms that relate to the pole size position and the polarization tensor. It's kind of just like a, a projection term, if you will. And the real question is, what happens to this redshift as you let this little parameter delta go all the way to zero? And delta is related to f times l. So as delta goes to zero, this f times l is getting bigger. And the question is, is this projection term here going to get smaller at a rate fast enough to sort of cancel that divergence or not? And what ends up happening, I'm not really going to prove it, I'm just going to tell you, is that this, this projection term does not vanish for the non-transverse gravitational wave polarizations. It does for transverse gravitational wave polarizations. It doesn't for the non-transverse. And so when you're in this region of the sky where the gravitational wave's propagation direction and the position of the pulsar are anti-parallel, that means this redshift curve can basically just increase monotonically up to some point where you can no longer actually perform a Taylor series. There's some limiting frequency where you can't do that. But that's a very, very good result because we know the redshift is the effect of the gravitational wave on the pulse of signal. If it's just getting infinitely big, you know, you probably be making detections all the time, so it gives. Um, what we're going to do is change pictures again. So what we've been talking about is this case where you have the pulsar and the gravitational wave is my red arrow. So you can see that these are very nearly anti-parallel in this picture, but we're only looking at a single pulsar. And whenever we're dealing with a pulsar timing array, we're not actually looking for redshift. We're looking for timing residual. In fact, we're looking for correlated timing residuals. So we really need to consider an entire pulsar timing array. We need to see how this effect on the redshift actually appears for a full pulsar timing array. So instead of this picture, we're going to look at this one. I'm going to say we have two pulsars here. And I'm just going to, for convenience, assume that my two pulsars are located equidistant from the Earth, so they're both some distance all the way, and they're separated by some angle zeta. We still have a gravitational wave propagating along. Now what I want to sort of push out to you is the idea that this increasing redshift term for the non-transverse polarizations means we could possibly have an enhanced detector response to those non-transverse polarization modes. And I'm just also going to toss on the caveat when the separation angle between the pulsars is small. Now recall from earlier, we talked a lot about this, about how to perform this optimized cross-correlation to look for our gravitational wave signal. And when we did that, we said, well, if we want to look for a signal, we've got to take our timing residuals and correlate them. We've got to account for our source spectrum here. And then remember, we had that Helms and Downs coefficient. That was that expected curve that we wanted to see. That curve only depends on the angular separation of the two pulsars here. Well, it turns out, when you go from, a, from general relativity to a metric theory of gravity, you don't limit yourself anymore, you actually have to generalize this function here. So you actually end up calling it something called an overlap reduction function. Basically, a generalized form of this. So this, this Helms and Downs coefficient now becomes some function that basically has a frequency piece and the Helms and Downs coefficient. So you end up having this overlap reduction function, this thing here in the red box. And in general, if you plug some numbers into this function, the bigger the numbers you get, the more sort of sensitivity you have. So this is a number that tells you something about both the, the geometry of the pulsar Earth system and also something about the sensitivity you have to gravitational waves. So before we go any further, I also want to point out that when you're talking about pulsar timing rate experiments, you have some limitations that are based on the frequencies you're sensitive to and the distances to pulsars that are nearby. So I just want to sort of establish this. The smallest frequencies you're generally sensitive to for pulsar timing experiments are about one every 10 years. And the nearest pulsars, roughly on average, are about 100 light years away. So for pulsar coming experiments, this quantity f times l, which we've seen a couple of times now, has to be about a order 10. And what we can do now to try to sort of see how this increasing redshift effect manifests itself in the pulsar coming area is to plot this overlap reduction function that we defined on the last slide, and we can just see what happens when we're in the correct regime. So I think this will make a little more sense of the plot. 
Here's our overlap conduction function. So this is the thing that is geometric and it tells us something about sensitivity. It was before just a Hellings and Downs coefficient, but now we have some frequency dependence here. And you'll also notice that I've rewritten this as a function of f time del instead of just f, because we assumed that the distance to our two pulsars is the same, so it's okay to do that. Um, and this is what we're looking at here is a plot of this function for general relativity. So this is the plus mode that you typically see for general relativity. Now there's four colored lines. Each of these different colored lines represents the different angular separation of my two pulsars. So up here they're separated by pi tens, down here by pi halves. And these curved lines are the full overlap reduction function. So they're this full function, they've got frequency piece and Helms and Nows piece. The dashed lines are just the Helms and Nows term. So basically you just said I can toss the frequency part out. So what you can see for general relativity is that when you go to this region that we just talked about, where pulsar timing experiments are really valid, this region where f times l is up to order 10, these curved lines really basically flatten themselves out and more or less lie right on the Helms and Nows coefficient. And that's why, when you're in general relativity, you can just go ahead and toss this term out, and when you're doing your analysis, you can just use a Helix and Downs curve. So let's see what happens for some of our other polarizations. Um, the breathing polarization mode, if you'll remember that was this one that looks kind of like it's breathing, and it corresponds to transverse gravitational wave. Uh, you can see we have roughly the same type of behavior, so things are a little bit more messy, but for each of these different angular separations of my pulsar, I've more or less got these curves flattening out to lie on the Helms and Downs coefficient. So we can come to the conclusion again that it's probably safe to go ahead and just toss this out. Now, what happens when we get to the non transverse modes is a little bit weird, and that's what we might have expected based on that result of increasing redshift for certain sky locations. So this is the vector y mode. So if I have a gravitational wave moving to the right, sort of doing the stretching and squeezing in that same direction here. And again, each of these colors represents a different angular separation of my two pulsars. So you can see that when the pulsars are separated by sort of a larger distance as plotted, then the curve, the full function lies right on this dashed line. Uh, but when I get to coli pulsars, things get a little bit weird. So an angular separation of zero is so the pulsars are exactly coli. And you can see that, that this curve is not really coming anywhere near to this line flat. So in this case, it turns out that you need to keep this frequency dependent term in your overlap reduction function when you have these pulsars with a small angular separation. And also, furthermore, if you go back to this slide, I said a little while ago that this overlap reduction function tells us something about sensitivity. And if you look at these, these numbers on this axis, they're roughly over unity. But when we go to our vector y mode, you can see that we've actually gained an order of magnitude. So now we're going to go to the most extreme and most exciting case, which is the longitudinal polarization mode. This is the mode that I said earlier was really the most fully non-transverse gravitational wave we can have. And in this case, again, we have four different angular separations plotted for our pulsars. And you can see that none of them, I mean, this green one, for example, which is when the pulsars are separated by high fits in the sky, it's nowhere near this dash green line. Um, Purple one isn't coming really very close, the blue one is nowhere near, and then we have this crazy line here, which actually has the black dashes across it. And this was the case, remember way back when we looked at redshift and we said you could have a case where that redshift monotonically increases up to some limiting frequency. That is what is happening in this line. For these coli pulsars, this redshift is just monotonically increasing. And actually, if you were to zoom out, so this value of f times l are not very big, but if you actually zoom out, then eventually you get some really frequency where this thing will let off. So it doesn't blow up forever, but it blows up a lot in the meantime. And so effectively, for this longitudinal mode, you can never eliminate the frequency dependence in this overlap reduction function. You always have to have it. And furthermore, you gain not one, but a couple orders of magnitude and sensitivity here. So altogether, what this is telling us is that that enhanced redshift effect we saw for the single pulsar system basically means we have a very strong enhanced effect in our pulsar category when we have pulsars that are located by the, that are separated by small angles in the sky and we have non-transverse gravitational waves. Sydney, can I ask? So here um, FL equals 10 is the absolute smallest that we have right now. The mm -hmm. values are around a thousand. So did this level off at around a thousand? Is that or is it much higher than that? No, I think it 
ended up being around a thousand. I'd actually have to go look through like an old mathematical book because I know I looked at this, um, but I think I think it does. It's a very good question. Okay, so just to kind of summarize our implications here, basically this frequency dependence and these overlap production functions with the non-transverse polarizations means you get this wonderful enhancement in sensitivity. So if we have pulsars separated by small angular separations on the sky, then our pulsar timing rays are going to have an enhanced sensitivity or enhanced response to non-transverse gravitational waves. And, then, and most especially for scalar longitudinal gravitational waves. And you can actually observe this effect by plotting overlap reduction functions for the current undergrad pulsars. I wasn't sure how much extra time I would have. I have these plots. I don't know. We have 10 minutes until or two open for questions. Yeah, okay, so I probably have time to show these plots actually, um, which I will do in a moment. And I also wanted to point out there are some other results in the literature. Uh, people have asked all kinds of questions about testing general relativity, both with LIGO, with pulsar tendon rays, with LISA. And two results that people have come up with with completely different methods also suggest that pulsar timing rays should be more sensitive to some of these non-transverse polarizations. So it's, this is a result that agrees very well with other results in the literature. Um, future work, at least something I'm interested in working on, is trying to decide how feasible it would be to actually extract that polarization information from um, observations um, before we do summary. So, Basically, the curves we were looking at a minute ago were theoretical curves. We took a theoretical overlap reduction function as a function of f times l and plotted it. But we have a bunch of pulsars that nanograph the collaboration is looking at, and so we thought, well, let's calculate these overlap reduction functions. We know roughly, so sort of poorly, perhaps poorly modeled, but we know some, some estimate of the distance to the pulsar, and we know how our part of the sky was separated in terms of angles. So we took the pulsars, about, we had 20 pulsars at the time we did this, and we calculated overlap reduction functions for those pulsars. And so this is a longitudinal overlap reduction functions for that longitudinal node. And these are frequencies. And you can see um, we've got three different pulsars here, along with their angular separations and degrees. So these three pulsars are separated by fairly large, large angles in terms of degrees. And you, to some extent, you know, maybe we're, we're bigger than order unity on our axis here. But these curves pretty much flatten out straight away. Now, if you go to the two pulsars in nanograph that have the smallest angular separation in the sky, um, we have J1903 and J1918, they're separated by 10 degrees, and then these other two that are only about 3 degrees apart in the sky, you can see huge difference okay, in these two axes. Right? The last plot, I'm on order of 10 maybe, here I have 5,000, 10,000. So, huge increase in the value. Yeah. What are you actually observing? In terms of... In, in the, in the say, you, you look at your nanograph pulsar. So what signal is it that you're looking at? You're detecting the radio signal from the pulsar. And you're measuring the frequency. You're, you're basically detecting a time of arrival. So you're sitting at your radio telescope, and, and the idea is you have these millisecond pulsars that you can time on an atomic clock. Yeah. So then you, you actually sit out at your telescope, you're used to hearing a pulse, and you receive some, some pulses, and then you take those pulses and you compare them to a model you've constructed. So basically you say, if, if, my pulse, if my pulses are coming like an atomic clock, I should be able to predict exactly when they're going to arrive, right? And so what I'm actually going to go out and measure is, well, how, how close was it to the time I expected it to arrive? So I measure a time of arrival of a pulse, and I see how close that was to when I expected the pulse to arrive. From that, I create this thing that we call the time interval, which is the difference between them. And here, I probably should point out a few, it, it, I know it gets confusing because there are multiple frequencies. There's the frequency of the pulse from the pulsar, but the frequency here, this F, is always um, uh, the gravitational wave frequency. But the point here is that when we look at these pulsars that are separated by very small angular separations, we have this huge increase in this function. And what that tells us is that a pulsar timing rate can be much, much more sensitive to this. So I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up um, to sort of summarize the two parts of my talk. In the first part, we talked about constructing an optimal detection statistic for stochastic gravitational wave background searches with pulsar timing rays. And to do this, we took some uh, a, an optimal cross correlation that took into account a gravitational wave source spectrum and noise power spectrum. There are lots of useful applications of the statistic, but it's really just a proxy for a full Bayesian analysis. If you want to see details, I strongly recommend UCR preprint that's on the archive. 
And then in the second half of this paper, or of this talk, excuse me, we talked about how pulsar tender rays are potentially much more sensitive to non-transverse, uh, I should say non-transverse gravitational wave polarization modes than to those of GR. And so that gives us a wonderful sense that when we start to make detections from a regular, perhaps we can really strongly put some tests on general relativity and constrain other metric theories of gravity. If you're interested in more details, if you're considerably more details, please see our paper. Um, future plans could involve disentangling those polarizations. There are also people who are working on um, generalizing from an isotropic stochastic background to an anisotropic background. So I didn't really um, use this word earlier, but all of this work that involves a stoch stochastic background has assumed that we have an isotropic stochastic background. And there's currently a lot of effort going on both here and at JPL to try to understand what happens if you allow anisotropy to fit into this picture. So lots of interesting things coming, and with imminent detections, it should be really interesting to see what happens. Because of the way the detectors are situated, that 
um, it's not very easy to, to extract the polarization content. But I could be totally wrong. Though. This is just something I seem to remember reading. But anyway, it's a very interesting. These are interesting questions that we're all still asking. Yeah, Alan. So um, uh, you talked a little bit about the stochastic search, but not a lot. But of course, um, a signal could be kind of seeing a signal. In a, sto a stochastic signal, which is broadband, has a lot of frequencies, kind of hard, doesn't really pop out. But if you have, a, say, a single gravitational wave, a very loud one from a, from a uh, supermassive binary, um, it'll be more or less at one frequency, should pop out. And so I'm back to Jonah's question. Um, I would think that if, if you have such a thing, and if it's enhanced by a factor of a thousand, you just would look at the data and see it. You just see it right away. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Well, so the, the overall production function isn't, for, so for single sources, there's not an overall production function, right? So the overall production function is for stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds. Although you would be able to, in principle, you know, put the polarizations for the single sources, the overall production function is specific. Yeah, that's true. I don't, unfortunately, no, don't know. No, but there's still the, the fact, I mean, there's still the Helen's down. Well, the, enha the, enha the enhancement that you would get from the non chair It's all still there. Maybe I'm speaking out of turn here. No, no, I think. I think I don't know much about single source searches is probably the, the dilemma here. See, for, for those you don't need to, for a stochastic background, you have a pipeline, you have to analyze all the data you've got, and then something will statistically stand out. For a sine wave in the residuals, you just look, you'll see it if, if it's enhanced by a factor of a thousand. You should be able to see it all the time. If you want a sine wave projected onto some weird polarization. Yeah. No, but you're assuming that it's a uh, longitudinal polarization. So you need a model for that. Yeah, model. It's just that the, if you just look at the residuals, you'll see a signal, a sign of it. Just in time. Okay, and I know you've looked at it. I can't remember it. <laughs> this was paper wrote in 2012, and I've been so busy doing other things, I can't actually remember all the details. Um, uh, yeah. You had a plot of an array of different models extensions of the world too. Oh, is it kind of, is this like a little picture? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. how would you go about comparing the new measure with, is there some particular parameter that is good for checking each of these results? What, what, how would you compare the external results with the predictions of each? That's a really good question. I mean, that's something that certainly haven't talked too much about yet. I guess the only level we've thought about so far was if you can, if you can, if you can measure, if you can detect a gravitational wave and it's not one of the two of GR, you can certainly say GR is wrong. And if you detect the two polarization modes of GR, you can probably still put upper limits on, on some of these polarizations. But in terms of an actual specific theory, I think, I'm not really sure. I think, um, I know there's plenty of there's like this PPE formalism that people are using to look at various parameters of these theories, and you might be able to tie into that, but otherwise I think you might just have to pick a particular theory and understand what polarization content is there um, to, get, to really answer that question. So I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how one would robustly do it, given that there are so many of them. You know, it's almost like I'm not really sure where you would start to actually get into them and to really start to rule them out, other than, than really knowing a specific theory. But, just to know that you're in that Calabial manifold would be interesting. Oh, I just I couldn't resist that picture when I saw it, so I had to put it in. Any further questions? Yes. These are good questions. Probably a naive question, but it's one that we would like to wrestle with, and I'm not sure we completely have a perfect answer yet. What do you call the detection? Alright, so why don't we we have a binary neutron star, we see one, maybe we're lucky to see three. Like we know that they have false alarm rates, we know the backgrounds. I think we can take, uh, let's say, this, we're really lucky uh, somebody will see it and we manage that one too. Uh, how, how, do I, how do you claim a detection for stochastic background false alarm time? Like, you, you walk through the map of the detection physics, but I was trying to step back and see what would actually, I, you know, what would your paper say? I, So, okay, this is uh, not a naive question, it's an excellent it's question. Actually, it's, it's actually an ongoing discussion uh, in the IPTA and in, uh, you know, in, 
in our own community is is exactly this question. How will what will it take to convince people that you've detected it? Does it show him that you can make the health come down to care about of these uh, cross correlated time individuals? Um, is it saying that you've got a certain SNR that gets you off the statistic or can we show that that's not actually what we want to do? Do we do full phase analysis? What will it take? There is, it's, this is an ongoing... It's basically different schools of thought. And it's an ongoing... When we were working on this, we basically just went an SNR and would say, okay, that looks pretty good. But but that's obviously not going to work when we really get to the point where we have to convince people we've made it to that. Well, it's that. I think that would be great, except for it had like um, all sorts of well, that, that's the thing. So if we've got around 40 pulse sizes on yeah. the ground right now, right? So it's, it's a fairly saturated curve, but better be sample it. Yeah. Better off we be detection. But um, if this is the next, we don't know, is really, I think, the overall answer. Or we haven't really decided on one thing that we're going to do. It's a political question. Yeah, it's a political question. But in the end, it's a, it's a statistical standard, is all you can really make. Like, yeah. uh, this is this SNR is 5 sigma above what we expect from that. And then the usual thing that you do is if you have a continuous wave or stochastic background is always on, if you say, all right, you don't believe me? I'm going to take data for another 10 years. Exactly. That's, well, exactly. That is ultimately this, what you do. Yeah, yeah. But Absolutely. you read the paper, in our case, for an event that really didn't exist, what was it? Evidence for direct detection, I think. Choose your words. <laughs> <laughs> so we meant by that. It's a direct detection. This is the big dog they can be called the black dog fever. Black dog is synonymous with depression. But yeah, so this is, again, it's uh, ongoing and it's political and it's sensitive and it's something that we're trying to discuss with the further the, the adaptation of the community at large. So at the last IPT meeting, the band we invited uh, quite a few local members to have these discussions and what would it take for you to believe us? <laughs> I've asked the same question, obviously. <laughs> that sounds about right. Okay, so uh, why don't we thank Sydney again for your time.